My name's Dan Snow and I want to tell you about History Hit TV. It's like the Netflix for history. Hundreds of exclusive documentaries and interviews with the world's best historians. We've got an exclusive offer available to fans of Timeline. If you go to History Hit TV, you can either follow the information below this video or just Google History Hit TV and use the code TIMELINE, you get a special introductory offer. Go and check it out. In the meantime, enjoy this video. A soldier once needed to see his enemy's face before making a kill. Large caliber guns emerged on the field of war and the scale of the battlefield stretched from meters to kilometers. As front lines shifted faster than ever, artillery needed to be mobile, delivering pinpoint tactical blows. Soon, the power of the cannon was in the hands of the individual, with each new innovation advancing destruction. For the soldier on the front line, breaking through enemy defences can be vital to the success of a mission. Without the benefit of heavy armament, innovative weapons are needed to provide close fire support. Weapons that are lightweight and portable, yet deliver destructive force to tear through enemy strongpoints, placing artillery power into the hands of the individual soldier. In use with US military forces since 1969, this versatile attachment transforms a soldier's service rifle into a heavy-duty grenade launcher. The M203. The M203 provides infantrymen the ability to strike targets up to 400 meters away. Designed to penetrate windows and doors, specific rounds from the grenade launcher detonate once inside enemy emplacements, causing casualties within a 130 meter radius. Soldiers on the battlefield can choose between their service weapon or the launcher, with the firing mechanism allowing the two weapons to be operated independently. Grenades are launched from the M203 using an innovative propulsion system. When the M203 is fired, propellant is ignited within a high pressure chamber. The gases build up until they break their casing, escaping into a secondary low pressure chamber. This extreme drop in pressure expels the projectile with minimal recoil. To subdue human targets, the M203 can also fire flares, tear gas and sponge grenades. A simple but highly effective weapon, it delivers the explosive force of the grenade further, faster and with more accuracy than a soldier can deliver by hand. Before the inception of the launcher, the grenade was already a formidable weapon. Used to flush the enemy from tight quarters, it inflicted both physical and psychological damage. Requiring no setup or mechanical launch, a hand-thrown grenade could kill or maim dozens with a single blast. First issued by the United States Army at the close of the First World War and continuing service into the Vietnam conflict was the Mark II time-fused grenade. The grenade was well suited for World War I style combat. Logged into opposition trenches, they could be enormously effective, but often they became slippery in the muddy conditions while the fuses were useless when wet. To combat the issue, legendary gunsmith John Browning created a cast iron shell with 40 segments, which not only provided a surer grip, but also enhanced fragmentation. The iconic body led to the Mark II's moniker, the Pineapple. 
within the Mark II shell was either high explosive TNT or low explosive cordite powder. When the pin was pulled and the lever released, a fuse delay allowed five seconds before detonation. The iron casing shattered in all directions, the fragments destroying anything within a five meter radius. While grenades proved to be a highly effective weapon, they weren't without their pitfalls. Launched by hand, the grenade's range was limited and sometimes the enemy was quick enough to throw it back. To propel the grenade to a safe distance, the M79 grenade launcher was created. First seeing action in the Vietnam War, the simple shotgun-like design pioneered the propulsion system later adopted by the M203. Rugged, reliable, this lightweight grenade launcher has already proven itself in combat. When launched from the M79, the grenade round arms after traveling 30 meters before sending fragments flying over 1,500 meters per second. US servicemen, known as Thumper Men, would fire grenade rounds into coastal waters, thwarting Viet Cong swimmers attempting to plant explosive on anchored US marine vessels. While the Mark II grenade was last used by the US Navy in 1969, the M79 is still in use with military forces around the world. In wars past, handheld grenade launchers only offered a single shot. Multiple fragmentation rounds can now be blasted in rapid succession from the Milcor multiple grenade launcher. With a six-shot revolving barrel, it was first deployed in 2006 in Iraq. Simple, rugged and reliable, enabling troops to fire over 120 grenades per minute. With infrared settings for night operations, it assists troops launching assaults under the cover of darkness. In service with more than 50 countries around the globe, the M32's simple yet highly effective design makes this semi-automatic revolver a formidable battlefield adversary. Throughout some of the darkest years in modern history, a desperate hail of gun and artillery fire rained down upon the 700 kilometer long Western Front. Axis and Allied soldiers battled, struggling to break out of the static, mud-filled trenches. The Allied infantry needed the power of mobile artillery. The Stokes Mortar. The revolutionary Stokes Mortar provided indirect firepower that could be moved at a moment's notice. Designed by British engineer Sir Wilfred Stokes, it weighed just over 47 kilograms, enabling it to be operated by a two-man team. Lightweight and portable, the initial design could project high explosive rounds over 700 meters into enemy trenches. Stokes's design did not immediately interest the British Army, as it was incompatible with existing mortar ammunition. However, future Prime Minister David Lloyd George recognised the immense benefit of Stokes's weapon, and his intervention saw it deployed to the front by 1916. Two decades later, Adolf Hitler invaded Poland. When Britain declared war against Nazi Germany in 1939, an updated Mark II had been adopted as the standard British mortar. Able to fire further and faster than its predecessor, it would go on to be used throughout every theatre of battle by Allied forces. One team member dropped the bomb into the muzzle, which struck a firing pin, igniting the propellant and firing the bomb towards the target. The mortar's trajectory could be altered by changing the angle of the weapon. A skilled mortar team could discharge as many as 30 bombs per minute. The model that entered the war had a range of 1.5 kilometers, almost 40% shorter than its Nazi equivalent. After trialing a series of new propellants, the Mark II could reach 2.5 kilometers, outstripping its Axis counterpart. Sir Wilfred Stokes, 
the forefather of the portable mortar, was rewarded with a knighthood in 1917 for his visionary design, which aided Britain's triumph in both world wars. As the American troops moved throughout the Pacific Islands during World War II, they were routinely confronted with an enemy firmly dug into an elaborate series of fortifications and bunkers. Harnessing an element that had been feared and revered since the dawn of man, the US Army would flush the Japanese from their unyielding positions with the M2 flamethrower. The modern flamethrower made its debut in the First World War. Imperial German soldiers emerged on the Western Front flushing Allied soldiers into the open where they could be cut down by conventional fire. By World War II, the flamethrower, able to reach deep into enemy strongholds, was adopted by the Allies. And here's one of the latest American flamethrowers. Flamethrowers have been used with notable effect in the Far East. They're a terrifying weapon. Originally filled with gasoline, the portable fuel tanks were later filled with napalm, increasing their lethality. Often, the M2 struck a psychological blow, with many Japanese soldiers beating a hasty retreat rather than face the flames. During the Battle of Iwo Jima, Corporal Herschel Woody Williams faced a network of Japanese pillboxes. Armed with an M2 flamethrower, over the course of four hours, he cleared seven enemy strongholds under a barrage of concentrated enemy gunfire. With searing bursts of flame, he eliminated machine gun nests and enemy riflemen. For his courage under fire, Corporal Williams received the Medal of Honor. Soldiers tasked with spreading the liquid fire suffered a high mortality rate. The flamethrower's limited range meant the operator had to get dangerously close to enemy positions. And with a fuel tank strapped to their backs, they were attractive targets for snipers. However, with fire driving back the most determined of enemies, the M2 continued to serve throughout Korea and the Vietnam War before it was retired from the battlefield in 1978. Combining the reach of a grenade launcher with machine gun rapid fire, this weapon gives frontline troops the ability to lay waves of suppressive grenades at targets over two kilometers away. The Mark 19 grenade launcher. Debuting in the Vietnam War, the Mark 19 was fitted to US Army boats patrolling the Mekong Delta. The fully automatic, belt-fed Mark 19 can unleash 375 grenades per minute. Since its inception, it has undergone significant improvements, with the MOD-3 being adopted by the US Army in 1983. Weighing over 35 kilograms, it is now fitted to Humvees, strikers and amphibious assault vehicles. The pressure from each fired round is harnessed to reload and recock the weapon, giving the Mark 19 a continuous stream of incredibly lethal firepower. When loaded with the M430 high explosive grenade, the Mark 19 will kill anything in its 5 meter blast radius and maim anyone within 15. As the US Army works to increase its rate of fire and muzzle velocity, the Mark 19 is set to become even more deadly. Able to launch grenades further, faster and more accurately than any lone soldier could, this killing machine is assured its place on the battlefields of the future. To strike at armoured cavalry, weapons need to possess a lethal combination of reach, accuracy and power. Blasts delivered from a distance need to penetrate steel, Kevlar and explosive reactive armour to wipe out the moving bunker that is the tank. At the onset of the Second World War, German tanks swarmed through Europe. A portable, lightweight tank killer was needed and it would emerge on the battlefield with American infantry. Named by General Dwight Eisenhower as one of the four tools that helped win the war, the bazooka would become a battlefield icon. 
the forefather of all modern handheld rocket launchers, the bazooka became a legend during World War II. Simple to operate and inexpensive to manufacture, more than 112,000 of the initial model were produced. Nicknamed for its vague resemblance to a 1930s musical instrument, the bazooka fired a shape-charged warhead. Propelled by a rocket motor, the round was fitted with fins to stabilise flight. The high-explosive anti-tank warheads were devastatingly effective. The energy from the explosion was concentrated to a hollow point at the tip of the warhead, creating a superheated jet of gas that could slice through armour plating. Now for the American bazooka. Once a hush-hush weapon, bazooka too has a very remarkable effect on enemy tanks. One German tank crew in Tunisia surrendered because they thought they were up against a six-inch gun. When the Nazis in North Africa captured several bazookas, the rocket launcher was reversed engineered to create the Panzerschreck, German for tank terror. Entering the battlefield in 1942, the Panzerschreck could penetrate 210 millimetres of armour, thicker than that on any Allied tank. Initial models of the bazooka could be unstable, sometimes jamming with an exploding warhead still inside. While the weapon had no recoil, it did have a powerful backblast that gave away the position of the shooter. Fatalities were high amongst bazooka crews, and so the weapon was constantly updated as the war progressed. Different variants of the bazooka remained in use until the Vietnam War, where it was superseded by even more devastating anti-tank weapons. During recent action in the Middle East, vehicle bombs driven by insurgents on suicide missions were routinely used to attack Allied targets. Impervious to bullets, these armoured machines were stopped with a weapon brandishing the firepower of a cannon, minus its powerful kickback, the recoilless AT-4. Although recoilless weapons had been used in both world wars, it was during the Korean conflict where they rose to prominence, providing large caliber firepower at the infantry level. The combined weapons of the United States Army are superior to those of any other army in the world. And the miracle weapon of them all, the recoilless rifle, an easy firing weapon packing the punch of an artillery piece. Imbuing the power of a cannon with mobility, recoilless rifles were highly effective against lightly armoured vehicles. Unlike rocket-powered bazookas, recoilless weapons fired modified artillery shells that had no additional propulsion once they exited the barrel. A cartridge would be placed in the rear breech. When fired, propellant gases would escape from the perforated casing, filling the rear vented breech and expelling the round. A large amount of the propellant blast was allowed to escape from the back of the rifle, eliminating recoil. This ingenious method removed the need for a recoil system, making certain models light enough to be fired from the shoulder. Highly evolved from its Korean-era predecessors, the AT-4 has been an essential anti-tank weapon of the US Army for almost two decades. Developed in the early 1980s, the AT-4 uses propellant charges that can be operated safely in confined spaces. Perfect for urban combat. A one-shot weapon, its fiberglass launcher tube is disposable after a single round. Whilst it can't destroy a main battle tank, it can penetrate up to 500 millimetres, enough to eliminate armoured vehicles, fortified buildings and bunkers. The power and practicality of the AT-4 has made it one of the most trusted anti-light take weapons in the world. 45 years after its inception, it is one of the most widely deployed tank killing weapons. Able to be launched from the ground or in the air, it is used by more than 45 countries around the globe. The TOW anti-tank missile. During the Vietnam War, Soviet-built T-34s with heavy sloped armour were seemingly impervious to most traditional anti-tank weapons. The bazooka gave troops some anti-tank firepower, but with its rockets unguided, it lacked pinpoint accuracy. 
the TOW, or tube-launched, optically-tracked, wire-guided missile allowed US troops to keep the enemy tank in its crosshairs and guide the missile to its target. When the TOW is fired, its kick motor ejects the missile from the launch tube. Once it travels 300 meters, the main rocket ignites, propelling the warhead at the speed of sound. With the gunner's eye trained on the target, signals from the optical sensor travel along the warhead's wires, correcting the trajectory of the missile and guiding it to its destination. Modern TOWs have an extended nose probe, ensuring that the missile detonates at the optimal moment after contact with the tank. Their tandem warheads, able to destroy reactive armor up to 900 millimeters deep. Mounted on a range of military vehicles, from Jeeps to Humvees, it can also act as a bunker buster. With over 650,000 produced, this legendary weapon has eradicated tanks in Vietnam, Iraq and Afghanistan, continuing in service to this day. First fielded by the Soviet Army in 1961, this lethal battlefield weapon is the most widely used anti-tank arm in existence. The RPG-7 rocket-propelled grenade launcher. With over 9 million produced to date, the RPG-7 has been used in almost every conflict in the world for the last half century. Manufactured in nine countries, its rugged, simple, low-cost design has made it popular with regular military forces and insurgents alike. Destroying everything from bunkers to armoured tanks and even helicopters. In October 1993, rebels in Mogadishu, Somalia used the rocket-propelled grenades to shoot down two US Army Black Hawks. The crash and the ensuing battle cost the lives of 18 US soldiers. The RPG-7 is a steel and wood design with a flared end shielding the shooter whilst reducing recoil. Its 40 mm steel tube is reloadable with shape charge rounds. When the RPG is fired, gunpowder expels the round at 115 meters per second. As the round leaves the weapon, two sets of fins pop out to stabilize the grenade in flight, the larger set maintaining direction while the smaller fins induce rotation. After the round travels 10 meters, its rocket motor ignites, increasing its speed and propelling to a range of 1,100 meters. The deadly blast destroys anything in a 10 meter radius. Responsible for half of all US casualties during the war in Iraq, the RPG-7 is a compact weapon system that will be remembered as one of the most notorious killing machines in history. Able to defeat any known armor in the world, this fearsome killing machine can strike head on or rain down a lethal blow from above. Referred to as the world's best shoulder-fired anti-tank weapon, its targets only have a 5% chance of survival. The FGM-148 Javelin. Designed in the US in the late 1980s, the Javelin entered service with the US Army and Marine Corps during the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Used to devastating effect, the Javelin gave infantry the ability to strike precision targets during counterinsurgency operations. Delivering its tandem heat warheads over 4,500 meters, it has the range and power to take on fortified enemy positions. The Javelin's incredible 95% hit rate is accomplished via infrared sensors and an onboard tracking system that guides the missile to its target. Once the soldier fires the weapon, he can immediately seek cover unlike wire-guided systems that require the shooter to maintain their aim until impact. The Javelin delivers two charges, the first to detonate explosive reactive armor and the second to cut through base armor. Increasing the Javelin's effectiveness is its ability to strike targets from above. Able to fly over obstructions, the warhead then plunges vertically 
attacking top armor, which is generally thinner and more vulnerable. One of the most advanced field missile systems in the world, the Javelin leaves the enemy with nowhere to hide. With modern wars fought on fast-moving battlefronts, technological advances have seen immobile siege engines replaced with lighter and more mobile weapons. Swift-moving artillery of great versatility has evolved to deliver the strikes where needed without sacrificing killing power. On the modern battlefield, there are no artillery regiments more mobile and deeper penetrating than airborne. Airborne operations are essential, delivering troops and equipment into inhospitable war zones without an airstrip. These expeditionary forces are able to deploy rapidly via parachute drop anywhere in the world. They need a lightweight yet powerful gun, the M119 Howitzer. First deployed in 1989, the M119 excels in its air assault artillery role. Weighing just over 1,800 kilograms, the M119 can be sling-loaded into battle or deployed by parachute, wherever combat troops need direct or indirect heavy firepower. Blasting up to six 105mm rounds per minute, the M119 can eliminate the enemy from almost 20 kilometers away with high-explosive rocket-assisted projectiles. One of the most portable, high-powered guns in the US Army's arsenal, the M119 has served as a workhorse with their airborne divisions for a quarter of a century. During World War I, artillery barrages were used to blast corridors through belts of barbed wire, clearing paths for infantry to advance. 1,738,000 shells were fired at the Germans during the opening week of the Battle of the Somme alone. By war's end, 70% of all casualties were caused by artillery. Amongst the carnage, one weapon stood above all others. Known as the French 75, it was the forefather of modern artillery. Employing a revolutionary recoil mechanism, it doubled the speed of artillery fire. Prior to the 1890s, artillery had no method of absorbing recoil. The immense energy from each blast sending gun carriages hurtling backwards after each shot. Repositioning consumed valuable time. French forces wanted a gun that offered a much faster rate of fire that didn't have to be realigned after every shot. Using a hydro-pneumatic recoil mechanism, the French 75's wheels remained perfectly still throughout the firing sequence increasing the rate of fire from 10 to 20 rounds per minute. When the gun was fired, its barrel slid back on rollers, pulling a piston back through an oil-filled cylinder. The oil travelled into a second cylinder containing a floating piston, which separated the oil from compressed nitrogen gas. The surge of oil would drive the piston forward, further compressing the gas, which in turn drove the oil, piston and barrel back to their original positions. After the onset of trench warfare, new demands placed on the French 75 saw it inflicting high volumes of fire at strategic targets, forcing the lines back. With a rifled steel barrel, the gun could blast shrapnel or melanite high explosive shells up to 8,500 metres. Serving as the primary field artillery weapon for France and the US, over 21,000 guns fired 200 million shells at German positions. Ahead of its time, the French 75 pioneered mobile rapid fire, becoming one of the most influential innovations in military history. The bloody Korean conflict was a fast-paced rolling war with front lines constantly shifting and battles spread across the countryside. Artillery needed to be mobile without lacking power. The M101 howitzer was one of the most deadly weapons unleashed by US forces in Korea. Operated by an eight-man crew, the gun was simple and consistent.
firing 105 mm high explosive rounds, clearing any obstacle that prevented troops from advancing. The artillery fire causes more enemy casualties than any other weapon. Three-fourths of all enemy casualties are caused by the artillery. Artillery is the infantry's best friend. One of the first heavy-duty artillery pieces designed to be transported by truck, it proved to be an adaptable and hardy weapon, durable in all terrain. Forward observers were tasked with locating the enemy in the mountains of Korea. Often they'd be aided with eyes in the sky, aerial spotters relaying the location of potential targets. When enemy batteries were concealed by camouflage or inclement weather, radar could be used to pinpoint the target day or night. The scanner's electronic rays bounce back from any object in their beam to pinpoint the target. A convoy, a patrol, even tracking an enemy shell. And so, a howitzer lets one go. These highly coordinated attacks would blast a path for infantry to follow. To sustain a moving frontal assault, artillery pieces would be sent forward, either transported by vehicle or airdropped into the Korean jungle. The M101 was so adaptable and reliable that it went into service with over 65 countries around the world. With over 10,000 produced, it became one of the most prolific mobile field guns ever fired in battle. Travelling at 56 kilometres per hour, this mobile howitzer can keep pace with modern mobile infantry units. Resembling a tank, this long-range weapon is able to strike targets 30 kilometres away. Highly computerised and automated, it can receive target information, compute firing data, aim and fire, all in under one minute. The Paladin self-propelled howitzer. Throughout the Korean War, mobile howitzers, able to blast shells at high trajectories, were always in need by US forces. To add to their arsenal, tanks were angled on makeshift dirt ramps to achieve high-angled shots. Arriving in time for the Vietnam War, the M109 Paladin provided infantry with shoot-and-scoot heavy fire support. Evolving throughout its service life, the new and improved M109A6 first saw action during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Target information from a command center is fed into the Paladin's advanced fire control system, while GPS ensures that the 155 mm shells accurately hit their target. Far superior than any Iraqi artillery, the M109A6 could fire on the enemy and relocate before its round struck the target. However, the Paladin is not without its faults. During an artillery firefight north of Najaf, one misfired, leading to its demise. Thankfully, the crew were able to escape without serious injury. Despite this incident, military forces cannot solely rely on aircraft to deliver long-range strikes, meaning the Paladin will remain the principal self-propelled howitzer for the US well into the foreseeable future. After World War I, Germany was forbidden from developing artillery weapons under the Treaty of Versailles. To skirt around the limitations this placed on their arsenal, the Nazis developed a secret weapon that would be produced in the millions. The Nebelwerfer. The Nebelwerfer, meaning smoke mortar, was a name given to the lethal rockets in an attempt to fool the League of Nations of their true purpose. While the world was led to believe that these rockets were designed as smoke screens, they were, in fact, delivery devices for poisonous gas and high explosives. Produced in a range of sizes, they were ripple fired from launchers mounted on towed carriages or half-tracked vehicles. These German motion pictures show batteries of rocket guns, a nightmare of sights and sounds. 
The shrill noise of incoming rounds led the Allies to name the rockets the Screaming Mimi. Used throughout almost every Nazi campaign during the war, more than six million Nebelwerfers were produced. The rockets packed a powerful punch, their thin walls allowing much larger quantities of gases or high explosives to be delivered than artillery or mortar shells of the same size. Barrage tactics were used to bombard the enemy, with spin-stabilised rockets striking targets almost eight kilometres away. Crews would load and aim the rocket launchers, firing with a remote switch after taking cover from the toxic exhaust fumes. The fumes had other disadvantages, revealing the position of the Werfer crews, leaving them vulnerable to counter battery fire. After the Nibelwerfers were launched during the German invasion of Russia, the Red Army retaliated with their own lethal rocket system. The Soviet BM-13 Katyusas were the world's first self-propelled multiple rocket launchers, able to redeploy immediately after firing. Simple in design, they consisted of a rack of parallel launch rails mounted on the backs of trucks. The Katyusas were able to saturate a target area more quickly than conventional artillery, with a battery of four launchers able to deliver the same firepower as 72 guns. While they were slow to reload, taking almost an hour to load 24 rounds, their ability to move before being located by the enemy made them highly effective against the Germans. The success of the Katyusas in World War II led to their continued development with multiple rocket launchers still produced to this day. The last word in shoot and scoot warfare, this fearsome killing machine can deliver a catastrophic payload, then disappear at over 64 kilometres per hour. Unleashing its fire, it can eliminate an entire square kilometre, earning the nickname the Grid Square Removal System. The US Army's M270 was deployed during Operation Desert Storm. During the 1983 conflict, the multiple launch rocket system blasted Iraqi targets with over 10,000 rockets. The fully tracked M270 can unleash a sudden and targeted firestorm from the protection of its armoured hull and then flee over the most unforgiving terrain. Supplementing traditional artillery, the M270 can deliver a mix of 12 guided and unguided surface-to-surface -surface missiles. Its electronic fire control system can fire all 12 rounds in succession in less than 60 seconds. Each rocket contains 644 sub-munitions, grenades that are armed during freefall, delivering over 7,000 blasts on targets over 32 kilometres away. The M270 can also be used to launch the long-range Guided Army Tactile Missile System. Using GPS technology, these ballistic missiles can strike targets more than 300 kilometres away, delivering a high volume of devastating firepower at lightning-fast speeds. The M270 is now in service with over 14 countries across the globe. The inception of heavy artillery caused battlefields to stretch to unprecedented scales. As the First World War played stage to the supergun, targets over 100 kilometres away were suddenly in reach. From atomic weapons designed to decimate thousands, to intelligent howitzers providing infantry support, heavy artillery forever changed the way wars were fought and won. Shells blasted from this howitzer travelled at three times the speed of a Boeing 747. With over 40,000 rounds fired since its relatively recent battlefield debut, its wide range of innovations have resulted in the most accurate piece of artillery in history, the M777 howitzer. 
the M777 first saw action in Afghanistan in 2005. Inevitably constructed from titanium and aluminium, it is relatively lightweight and rapidly deployable. Weighing just 4,100 kilograms, the M777 can be transported by helicopter, providing amazing operational flexibility. A 155 mm howitzer, the M777 can strike precise targets thousands of meters away, regardless of terrain and obstacles. The gun's digital fire control system is used to calculate the variables required for a pinpoint strike. Whilst allowing the M777 to be teamed with advanced rounds, such as the Excalibur GPS guided munition. So accurate is the Excalibur, it can be used to strike targets within just 75 meters of friendly troops. Once the Excalibur is fired, it deploys its fins. A GPS system manipulates the fins, guiding the round's trajectory. This system is so effective that the gun can be aimed 20 degrees off target yet still deliver an accurate strike. It even has a built-in failsafe that disarms the warhead if it has strayed too far off course. In June 2012, the M777 made history when it dropped an Excalibur round on insurgents 36 kilometers away. It was the longest operational shot in history. Setting the standard for sophisticated precision fire support, the M777 is the pinnacle of big gun technology and fearsome firepower. Known as the Black Dragon, this monstrous piece of weaponry weighed over 29 tons. First entering service with the US Army in World War II, it was their heaviest piece of field artillery in existence, the M1 howitzer. As Allied forces struggled to liberate Italy from the Nazis, their troops became stuck at the Gustav Line. To divert German resources, Winston Churchill planned amphibious landings at Anzio on Italy's west coast. The goal was to break the line and capture Rome. The initial beach landing of January 1944 was a success for the Allies, but they became pinned down by the Germans and months of fighting ensued. With a barrel length measuring over eight meters, the M1 entered battle for the first time, striking down opposing artillery. From carefully concealed positions, the big berthers of the army speak. After months of bitter fighting, the Allies broke past the beach and went on to capture Rome. The Black Dragon's devastating firepower and incredible accuracy was credited for its role in the victory. Although they were largely retired after World War II, these enormous guns would once again be called upon during war in Korea. The US Army had encountered Chinese fortifications impervious to smaller artillery weapons. Twelve Black Dragons were sent to the front line to eliminate these enemy strongholds. On May the 1st, 1953, the first ceremonial shot fired from an M1 struck a communist ammunition depot. The lucky strike caused a chain reaction that would obliterate an entire hilltop. The Black Dragon had arrived. To detect enemy batteries concealed in the mountainous landscapes, US troops employed a strategy known as sound ranging to locate and respond to artillery attacks. Those are sound detectors the crew is setting up. Placed in different positions, they'll pick up from several angles the sound of an enemy gun. The sound wave of a single artillery shot would reach each microphone at a different time. The variance in the time would then be calculated and the map coordinates determined before the information was relayed to the artillery fire direction center. Within seconds, the order goes out to an artillery battery. And for an enemy gun crew slamming shells into our lines, this may be a death warrant. A mere three months after the Black Dragon's arrival in Korea, 5,943 shells had been fired. Obsessed with destructive power, Adolf Hitler would push the Nazi war machine to create some of the largest artillery pieces in history. 
Designed to take advantage of Europe's vast railway networks, this heavy artillery piece was able to move far and relatively fast. The Krupp K5 railway gun. Enlisting the Krupp family, a 400-year-old German weapons dynasty, Hitler commissioned 25 enormous 283mm guns that could be transported by rail. Each K5 battery of two guns required three trains for transportation, a train for each of the guns and a third for the 85 troops, of whom 42 were the gun crew plus ammunition and supplies. With a range of 64 kilometres, the K5 could hit targets well out of ordinary sight. In order to gain accurate positions, a spotter would be sent up in an observation balloon. Their findings would then be relayed to fire detectors who would compute fire data, taking into account a myriad of factors, including the curvature of the earth. The K5's 21.5 metre long rifled barrel provided great accuracy, with deep spiralled grooves causing the 265 kilogram shells to spin as they shot out of the barrel providing the projectiles with greater aerodynamic stability. During the Battle of Anzio, the Nazis unleashed an artillery barrage designed to drive the Allies back into the ocean. Two K-5 guns nicknamed Anzio Annie and the Anzio Express caused over 22,000 casualties as they rained down shells on 70,000 Allied troops attempting to break out of the secure beaches below the Alban Hills. Inflicting both physical and psychological damage, these behemoths were some of the most successful railway guns of World War II. Until they were finally captured by the Allies during their ultimate victory at Anzio. Throughout the Cold War, muscle flexing on both sides of the Iron Curtain led to a series of technological developments in nuclear weaponry. In a demonstration of United States power, President Eisenhower's 1953 inauguration parade showcased a stockpile of weapons. Amongst the missiles and servicemen, there was a lone cannon capable of unleashing nuclear rounds, the M65 atomic cannon. In the early stages of the Cold War, the Pentagon designed the world's first and only nuclear gun. Known as Atomic Annie, the 280mm towed cannon was capable of wiping out entire enemy divisions with a blast from a single shell, exceeding 13,000 tonnes of TNT. Measuring over 25 metres and weighing over 77 tonnes, she was the largest road mobile artillery piece ever built. Named after the captured Nazi Anzio Annie gun, Atomic Annie was deftly manoeuvred by road. Two tractors with independent steering transported her along America's highways, their individual drivers communicating via a built-in telephone system. Once at her destination, she could be ready to fire in as little as 15 minutes. Where Anzio Annie needed a crew of 85, Atomic Annie needed just seven. The shell is driven home by hydraulic rammer, and next, the heavy powder charge to propel it. On the 25th of May, 1953, a single 385 kilogram shell was successfully fired from Atomic Annie across the desert of the Nevada test site. Nine seconds later, the shell exploded. The catastrophic blast throwing debris 152 metres in all directions. A mushroom of smoke rises more than 20 miles away in the first pictures released by the Defence Department of America's new atomic weapon in action. After the successful test, 20 of the M65 cannons were produced and sent to strategic locations throughout Europe and Korea. Despite their potential destructive power, the test firing was the only time that a nuclear warhead was ever shot from an artillery piece. Rapid developments in nuclear technology enabled lighter rockets and missiles to deliver long-range atomic strikes. 
but the mere presence of atomic artillery served as a deterrent, reminding all of the horrific potential of history's deadliest gun.